Amen. Father, we're grateful. January, March, January, February, March, April is past. Today is the first Sunday in the month of May. We're thankful. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the perfect and the finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins and for the gift of righteousness. Thank you for grace and mercy that never fails. Thank you for progress you've made. Thank you for the word of the Lord. Thank you for the grace of the Lord. We give you praise and glory today. Thank you for what you've done and what you're doing and what you will yet do. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Please help, help me help your neighbors sit down and welcome them to church. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And while they're coming, I want to invite Brother Ikena Umogo to come and share his testimony. Will you please give him the microphone as he comes up? You can come with your son if you want to come with him, it's okay. And if your wife wants to come with you and mommy wants to come, they can all come. If your wife and they want to come, they can all come too, it's okay. Yeah, give him a microphone. Praise the Lord. Will you, I wanted to stand, let me stand, I want to stand over here, I want them to see you clearly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Praise the Lord. let me just give you a background. After the second service, he met me, which he attended with his wife and his mom. And he said, this, today is my first time here. He said, but I received a miracle in September last year. I want to testify about. So, go ahead, sir. Praise the Lord. Okay, um, as of last year, I didn't really used to follow NLP. Yeah. But my wife always sends me every link every morning. So, at a point, I decided to... Based on disturbance, I started to start following it. So, um, 2022 has just been a year of avoiding death. Um, in August, sorry, in July 24th, we gave birth to my son. And for a few minutes after he was born, he wasn't breathing. So they had to rush and do everything. But my wife always has this thing, this belief that Pastor Via said, you're going to have a child, you're going to have it. And to the glory of God, he came out fine. Look at the child. Now, to crown it all, I was supposed to travel on September 8th last year to the U.S. I missed my flight. On the 10th, I was going to Ikorodu to visit some of my friends just to hang out. At Iyano Solo, I was in a bus. And then a trailer came from behind and slammed into us. Some people in the bus with me died. This happened at 12 p.m. Some minutes to 12, rather. I was taken to a nearby hospital. They did some stitches, but they couldn't do anything, more for, anything further. So they asked us to go to Luth or wherever. I got to Luth by 2 p.m. I couldn't get into a bed till 10.30 p.m. at night. Now, they did, they checked me, I did ultrasound, I did, uh, I did CT scan and all that. And they found out that my liver, minus, other than the normal injuries, the bruises I had, I didn't have any fractures, thankfully. My liver was lacerated, 25 cm long and 6 cm deep. What does that, what does that mean? Lacerated, I mean torn. So it was basically torn in two. Your liver was turned into two? Yeah. yeah. How long? 25 cm long. Wow. That's practically the whole length. And then 6 cm deep. But they didn't even realize it as at that first uh, ultrasound. So later they said that, okay, I was going to have to do a surgery. That was like almost two weeks later. I was going to have to do so. But I was in A and E for that period. That's in my emergency unit. Yes, yes. I couldn't even move my head. I couldn't move my body. People had to help me. Found to, my wife had just given birth like a few months before. She was supposed to be breastfeeding the baby, but she was always with me in the hospital morning till night. So if I wanted to, even, if I wanted to go to the toilet, somebody has to clean me up. I couldn't even move any part of my body. So, but thankfully, in September, that same September, um, they were, uh, Pastor B was doing a healing service 
that period. And then the healing service was on a Monday. So I was supposed to do a surgery on Saturday. The doctor said they didn't trust the radiology guys that they wanted the more experienced ones. So we moved to, to, to Sunday. Sunday, the radiology head said, no, radiology wants to do the surgery, not the normal doctors. They moved it to Monday. Now, Monday was the healing service. And then Pastor V said, if you, okay, touch the part of your body that you need healing. And normally, I always see when people fall and they say, oh, they are 19, and they're like, which day is my going to happen, sir? <laughs> so, as I laid my hands on my liver, because every other thing, I wasn't even bothered about all those scratches and stitches. They're not even my problem. I laid my hands on my liver and because I was scared of the surgery that was going to be done. I was putting a brave face, but I was really scared. And then he started praying. It wasn't even up to two minutes. Something cool, like a cool breeze just went through me from my head to my toe. Thank you, Jesus. And then um, when the doctors came for their ward round, because I called my wife after, immediately after that, I told her I've been healed. But I had to wait for them to come and do their obligatory checks and all that. So normally before then, if you touch me here, I'll be feeling like serious pain. So the main, the main doctor, the main surgeon came with them and he was looking at the last CT scan I did and he was like, why did they delay this surgery? That this is 25 cm long and 6 cm deep. They have to do the surgery immediately. So then he now touched me. I'm not like, okay, I'll be gentle with you. Are you feeling any pain? I said, no. He pressed it harder. Almost like as he wanted to, I was like, bro, like, bro stick it easy now. So he was really touching. Are you feeling any pain? I said, no, I'm not feeling anything. He said, I should go and do another ultrasound. I went back again that same morning to do the ultrasound. And then the radiology consultant, the radiology person, the radiologist, she checked me. She was confused. Because they're looking at the past results scans. That, that's the result of the screen. Yes, yes. That's the result of the screen. This is looking at the past results, yeah. and it was confusing to them. So they had to bring out the last two that I had done. It was conflicting with what this last one was showing. So she called. She called her senior colleague in radiology, because she was like maybe. This one is beyond her level or something. So she called the senior guy, and then the guy was, as he was checking me, he, was, he did the whole, started the whole process again. He was checking, and I was like, I don't see any lacerations. Then I was, I was just smiling and just thinking, I was just singing praises to God, and I was just smiling because I knew what God had already done for me. I was just waiting for them to confirm on their own, letting it be like I didn't hear from them. And then I asked him, okay, what about the accumulated blood? Because I had about 300 cm cube of blood accumulated on both sides. So that's why I was always feeling pain in my chest. I couldn't breathe well and all that. So he now checked here. He said, did they tell you that there was blood? <laughs> then funny enough, the, the, the female radiologist that had to call her senior colleague, she attends her vestas also. So she was now like, did you, she was like, did you listen to Pastor V this morning? I was like, yes. She was like, the day you are going to give testimony, I'll try and be in church that day. <laughs> Well, funny enough, I don't know her name. I don't know which of the parishes she at, churches she attends, but I know she's going to see this and she'll be happy. So, but um, I should have come since last year, but I had to travel actually because I rescheduled my flight when I missed it, knowing I was going to have an accident. Wow. So I rescheduled my flight. And then also, because I couldn't use my left arm, I couldn't even raise my baby as at that time, even when I left the hospital. So um, they gave me this neck collar to wear. And I was ashamed wearing that thing going to the U.S., but I didn't have a choice. They decided to wear it for like six weeks and then come back again for checks. But my wife said something to me. She said, when you were collecting the healing the first time, you held your liver. Now hold your arm. And this time around, because there was no treatment that they are not done, both the balm, everything, nothing was working. It was like it was in the nerve. So... That's when I was in the U.S. Uh, she always used to disturb me. And that was like about 12 a.m. that time. So she always disturbed me. Oh, yeah, NLP. Oh, yeah, pray the thing, pray the thing. I mean, I'm like, I don't even need you to ginger me again. <laughs> I've already experienced the first one. <laughs> so, so I always used to do that. And then I have to make a confession also because prior to my, test, my healing, 
Anytime you say um, offering and all that, and then share to your friends, my mind I'm like, ah, these people are looking for follow Ashley for <laughs> Hey. But I decided during that time when I was in the hospital, I decided to make a, so, um, a sacrifice of giving an offering every day, more than what I normally give for offering, every day with faith. So when that time happened, when I got the healing again, I think it was just like about two or three days after I traveled. I told my wife, like, because we did a video call, like, you're not wearing your neck I said, I don't need it again. I'm not feeling anything. So I also have to give glory to God. In this September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May. Glory of God. Let Thank your wife say much. something for one minute. Because this is a woman of faith. Say something, man. I'm actually overwhelmed. I've been very spiritual. And... <laughs> Your baby wants to say something. This was the baby that wasn't breathing when he was born. Yes. <laughs> so, I always believe that once you need anything, just say it to God in prayer and it will be done. I have that faith. I push for it. I push it. I push him as well. And I'm happy the, at the point where he is spiritually. I'm really, really, I'm grateful to God. So the miracle, it, the miracle, it changed his spiritual it life. It changed him. Wow. 100%. 100%. Praise God. Congratulations. Congratulations. God bless you. God bless you. Congratulations. Thank you for sharing. Wow. Somebody shout hallelujah. That's why I love the song that Ben and the choir were singing together about how great our God is. You know, it's great. How do you, you know, sometimes when they share the testimony, even though I'm praying with them, in my mind I'm thinking, how did that happen? What did God do? How did God do it? Because this person had a 25 centimeter, six, you know, six centimeter something deep. And God just healed it. The baby was born, not breathing. The lady said, they told us we'll give birth to babies, not dead children. And that baby came back strong. Every time you hear testimony, be reminded of the power, the faithfulness, and the goodness of our God. And let me tell you something. What he does for one, he will do for another. Someone say hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen, amen, and amen. Just a couple of announcements. We, we, I need to get into my teaching, you know, get into my teaching. Next Sunday, we will be back in church. Praise the Lord. Um, we'll be back in church. After service today, you can go through church and ask them that you want to see it. You want to see what it looks like. It's not, when we get back, we will still be working. Um, we will still be working. You will see when we get there. But, you know, we spent quite a lot of money just in the rental facility. If I'm correct, this meeting costed us $8 million just for today. You know, yeah, so I think we should be in church and finishing it up together and using the money to finish up. What do you think? Exactly, exactly. Amen. So you can, you can so we'll be in church. Um, the second thing is that July the 1st, we have NLP in Wembley. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. The, the announcements are all on the screen and we will love you to... Um, this is what we want to talk about Wembley. Of course, we want you to join us to come to Wembley. But also, some of you have family and friends in the UK and Europe. You can, you can send the link to them and get them to come. These are the kind of testimonies. You, um, one of our pastors from the UK, what are you, Mr. Stan, stand up, stand up. Yeah, from the UK is here, came in briefly, and uh, we're warming up. And, you know, a lot of things has been, been done in the, in the UK. And uh, just wonderful. I was in Wembley myself. When they saw the auditorium, saw all the planets and there, they just there's nothing that's going to hit the UK like that. They're going to witness the power of the risen Christ. Praise the Lord. There's no meeting that's ever held the UK that down. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to register because you know there's no way we can get inside without registration. It's like Nigeria where we're like, hey, Pastor B. No, you know, no, none of us is at the gates. It's when you come inside that you see us. Because the Wembley will control the Wembley, the Wembley security will control it. So you need to register. And just for you to know, registration is between is about 70% right now. It's about 70% right now. So you need to go ahead and register. 
I'm, I'm suspecting the next two weeks we will close down registration. I'm suspecting. And I don't want your friends and your family members not to get it. Amen. Amen. Um, the last announcement will be this. Or two announcements. So we're teaching about emotional issues. But there's a lot. there needs to be a lot of time to deal with it. So last Sunday of this month, which is 28th of May, we're having a special Sunday evening session where you can invite all of your friends to join. For example, in this service, there is no space. Please, if you're keeping seat for someone, we do not have any kind of space to sit. Please, choir, if you can help me so that they can give out some of your spaces in the choir area, I'll be really grateful. And there are spaces by the instrumentalist side, I'm not sure if they can see. So choir, if you can release some of the spaces by scooping forward a little, we'll really, really appreciate the space because we have 45 minutes to the end of this service and people are already outside. Glory. Even Pastor Yeli was telling me that they had to drive, uh, some people had to drive many, many, many minutes just to wait for the next one. All right. So, um, 28, we have an emotion. It's called Reveal. So, Reveal is a session to deal with, to, to biblically deal with all these emotional issues. If you have people that have trauma, have pain from their relationship, from their past, they've been raped, they've been abused, this service will really help them. We're going to provide more, sub, more details. For you to be able, it's going to, yeah, we're going to buy more details. I think, yeah, we're going to buy more details. And the last thing is the um, business acceleration course. Last year we did an experiment. So I'm a very practical person and I also love to be honest. You know, um, I wish prayer alone could do some of the things we pray for. I wish. But the truth is that prayer alone can do some of the things we pray for. So when I know a lot of people are praying for their business and finance, and I know they are praying. But they need wisdom and they need what? Knowledge. They need wisdom and they need knowledge. So that's why we have this course. Which we, did, we did a prototype last year and it was for eight weeks. It was phenomenal. I had someone that was doing 500,000 every month and the business was 500,000 to 5 million. And I had another woman that was, had a bakery. She was selling about 40 or 50 million every month and it moved to 70 million. There were people that got um, funding because there were funding opportunities of 50 million, um, people that got funding of, I think, 70 million, $800,000, thereabout. Someone got funding of $700,000. So, this is taking place. It's a paid service so that, you know, you need to take it serious. It's holding on in church. You know, it's holding a landmark. It's two full days, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. You know, it's, you know, and it can stand lower than 5 p.m. just for you to warn you. But you have the opportunity for to- a lot of things. Number one, you will gain access to funding if you're able to pass the interviews. Number two, you will meet people that can mentor you in business. And number three, you will also have networks of entrepreneurs that will support you. You need to register quickly because as soon, and it's hybrid. You can do it online, you can do it offline. You need to register quickly because as soon as it's filled up, it's filled up. So this is what we want to do. To, it, and it's going to be powerful. But, you know, we will pray for people. But more than that, you learn about sales, you learn about marketing, customer fulfillment, um, you know, business optimization, business mapping, just a lot of things you will learn there. If you did the Revolution Masterclass, I think you should go back and do this one. This one is way advanced and may ahead. Amen. One of the guys that lost the funding, he, he, he couldn't answer the questions of the, of the shark investors in the last class. I saw him. He said, Pastor, I'm, I hope I can register for this one. He said, I, said, I said, why? He said, I missed the funding. I'm coming back for the funding this time around. So, praise God. Hallelujah. All right. I'm ready for the word of God today. Amen. That testimony blessed me. Thank you for sharing that with me. You know, sometimes because we're very enlightened social people, many of you, God, do things for you that you hide. It's not a great thing. You can pray publicly, but you cannot thank God publicly. Don't be that kind of person. If God does something for you, no matter what, learn to testify. Remember that ten were leopards and one came back to thank God. And just kind of say, oh, that's wonderful. Just look back and say, where are the remaining nine. Thank God. Your marriage did 10 years. It's not easy. Many marriages collapse. Thank God for that. Your kids are five years. Some don't even have a child. Thank God you got healed. Those days it's small healing. You got a business miracle. Thank God for that. It's important. Always learn to write and send your testimonies. When you announce in church testimonies, be the first to testify. Why? The one that testifies will have more testimonies. Bible principle. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, let's get into the word of God today. Are you ready? Okay, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, once again, I want to thank you for the beautiful testimony we heard from, my, from your son. And thank you for always reminding us that your power is real. And thank you for what you are even doing today and bringing hope to people online and on site. Lord, today we're going into your word and looking at this special series on overcoming depression. I'm praying that you speak to everyone here. 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. One of the things I, when God called me to be a pastor was this. I said, Lord, there'll be no need for me to start a church. You know, some people want to start a church. I said, that's not me. I said, if you want me to be a pastor, one, I didn't know if it was a selfish reason. If I walk in an established church, I'm guaranteed income. You know, if I start a church, then I don't have anything. But one of the things I said to God was this, was that, Lord, if you really want me to start a church, please, I don't want to do whatever that person is doing because it's different. And that's why you notice in our church, we will teach or do things that other people are not doing. And we would also not just do that. We would talk about topics that are very hard. For example, the issue of depression is some, something that will be heard in church. Some of you have never even in your life heard the message about depression. But does it mean that depression does not exist? It does. So, as we teach, you know, um, Pastor Jerry, if we still have space, I see a lot of space in the choir area. If you can just help me move people there instead of clamming around the door, it would be a great idea. You know, Pastor, uh, Pastor George, if you just help me scoop, there's still a lot of space around the choir area. Just help me scoop around them. Yeah, praise the Lord. This is my story about depression. You know, one of the beautiful things of not being a pastor is this. When you, you know, when Walsh has a problem, Walsh is my brother over there. <laughs> you know, married to ATME over there. When they have a problem, either in their, in their marriage, in their business, in their finance, anything, they can always run to God and run to church to take care of it. Yes or no? Exactly. But the worst thing that happens when the pastor has a problem is that the problem is often connected to what? To church and God. So who does it run to? Nobody. And that's why you may not know this. Pastors sometimes are the most depressed people you ever meet. If our statistics shows that 80 or 90% of pastors eventually quit before retirement. Think of someone you know as a pastor. Is he a pastor today? He could still have the title. He doesn't do it again. And I remember the time in my journey and my wife is here and I, I got so depressed. And, you know, I've had phases of depression, but this time I didn't just get depressed. I got depressed and I became suicidal. The thought of ending it came to me. And this is why I'm teaching this today because people can look so good. They can look good like my brother over there with the nine years thoughts and they hear, you know, hey, they could look so good. But deep down inside them, they're depressed. And people see me show up and say, hey, Pastor B, I say, hey, hey, hey hallelujah, hallelujah. Ah, you know, and, you know, and I, I, I was pastoring. Everybody looked on the outside, but I, I was dying on the inside. And I sent my wife this message. I sent her at around 4 a.m. in the morning. And I said to her, just in case anything happens, I thought you should know this. Number one, I, I have this, I have this, I owe this, I don't have this, this is not mine, this is mine, this is mine. I sent her a list. And it was, you know, it, it, it was a way of saying that in case breath is gone from my nose, just know the details. <laughs> and my wife, you know, responded and said, what does this mean? I just, I'm just, I'm just sharing. And, and I'm saying so because, you know, if you saw me, you would never have known that I was going through a challenge. You would never have known that, although my body looked good, that my soul was dying. And that's what depression is. That your soul will begin to die. And she was able to reach out to one of my friends and my friend came and my friend, you know, and, and, and just to let you know, I hope that in your down days, there are people you can call. Oh my God. I hope, you know, when they say join cell, I hope you understand what they're saying. What they're saying is that have a community of people, when they say join small group, that in your down days, you can call. If you cannot call them, your spouse can call. There, there are cases of people that have been depressed, and their partner was in another country and they knew someone was having their husband at home. And they said, please call, force the door open. My husband is not, op is not well. Break the door. And my friend eventually showed up and he said, well, I got the text you sent to your wife. I don't know what's happening. But just for you to know, I booked you down the road. I'm here for three days. I'm going to stay here until this is over. He said, he said, he said, he said it's, either you, it's either you get it over with or I'll start living with you. Such a great friend. But that's how depression is. The depression is so strong. You, you can, you, you know, you can, you can have this bone, bone, what, what's the hair called? What? You know, you have bone straight air, but your heart, your heart is bone dead. Yeah. 
you, you can be busy singing, I'm unavailable. Meanwhile, I'm telling you, you, you can be busy singing it. Meanwhile, in your life, nothing is working. And when you say, people think that you're just singing a song, but the truth is that you're not available. There's no joy, there's no peace, there's nothing. Because the thing about depression is this. Why for some people, depression literally shows on them. Some people have found the good act of acting where they can put makeup on depression. They, they know how to speak. Oh, hello, how are you doing today? You know, it's, so, it's, it's going so great. You know, what, the other day I was just with my friend John and John is just, and they're speaking nice English but they're dying within their soul. See what the Bible says about depression. What does depression look like? John, Job chapter nine, 19 verse 2. Job chapter 19 verse 2. And in this teaching, what I'm trying to do is that some of you will have been through depression and you will never have been able to put a label that that's what it was. Some of you, you are there right now and you just know something is wrong, but you can't tell what it is. And, and the goal of this month's teaching, and this month is not one Sunday you come to church and you don't come the next Sunday. No, no, no. The goal of this month is that whatever pit you are in, the, the grace of God will reach out into that pit and pull you out of it. Listen to me. Light and life is coming back to your soul. If there are people under the sound of my voice. Everybody thinks it's okay, but you are dead. This is not who you married. This is not the husband that had visions and had dreams. This is not the girlfriend that you knew. This is not the boyfriend that you knew. But as life happened, they gave up on life. They are no longer living. They are just drifting. You know what it is to drift? We go with the flow. There's no more intentional living. John chapter, Job chapter 19 verse 2. See what Job says. He says, how long will you vex my soul? Have you seen people and all of a sudden you become agitated? Everybody, you, you literally back at everybody. But the reason why is that there's frustration that goes on within your soul. In fact, as soon as you came this morning, look at the car park. Look at this, look at that. You, and you don't realize that you're the one that is frustrated with it. And people tell you, why are you so sensitive? Well, the reason why you're so sensitive is that you found your place, yourself, in a place of depression. The psalmist says this in another way. He says, why are you so, he says, why are you so vexed in my soul? Why are you so vexed in my soul? Psalm 42 verse 6. Psalm 42 verse 6. Psalm 42 verse 6. This is very powerful. Psalm 42 verse 6. The psalmist says, oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. My soul is cast down within me means that I'm helpless. My soul. Have you not told me, let us pray. And they said that if you want to pray, pray. Me, I'm not praying. Because they've gotten to a point where they're exhausted. And they're just tired. And they do not want to try again. And just before I continue, I want to tell you what depression is. Because we are in a generation where people <laughs> miss a cab and they say, I'm depressed. And people just use words loosely. Depression is not the feeling of being down. You, if you're depressed, you will feel down. But it's every time you feel down, you're not depressed. The, depression is not the feeling of being low, of being upset, of being unhappy, or being sad. That's not what depression is. Those can happen when you're depressed. But primarily, that's not what depression is. Depression is not a character flaw. You know, I've had people, you know, you know, Pastor George, you know, you hear people say that, ah, how can you be depressed? Man up. What is man up? Depression is not, a, it's not, it's not a masculinity or femininity. It has nothing to do with that. When your body is sick, you, you could have typhoid, you could have malaria, you could have some kind of this sickness. The sickness, one of the sickness of the soul is depression. When people are sick, if they're sick in, in themselves, their soul is corrupted. And before you say man up, let me give you some big names in the Bible that were depressed. 
Before, before you feel as if, you know, you know, you know, because all the men, you know, like, you know, I, I can't be depressed. I mean, you should watch the first service. We had this, this man that his divorce in Nigeria became a social media blast for six months. It was news upon news upon news. He said, I was so depressed, I could not step out of my house. For one year. He said, because I thought that everywhere I go to, people will talk about me. He says, my soul, why? In fact, that's one of the signs of depression. When people are really depressed, they feel helpless. That's what I'm going to. They, you know, when you ask them, what do you want to do? They want to do nothing about what they're going through. You will hear them say things like, I can't come and kill myself. If God wants to help, let God hear me, help. The pressure is like character flaw. It's just before you think that it's for people that are not spiritual. Because some of you, you know, some of you pastors and spiritual people, you're like, I'm spiritual, I can't be depressed. What happened to Elijah? Elijah in first Kings was depressed. In fact, Elijah said, kill me, oh God. He said, God, kill me. Elijah was not just depressed. He was suicidal. The reason why is that you cannot change what you deny. So, your denying how you feel doesn't change it. It just makes you complicated. Neither can you hear what you abandon. Oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my. You cannot heal what you abandon. Someone says, everything will heal with time. That's not true. With time and the right things, everything will heal. But everything by itself will not heal with time. It says, my soul... Why thou cast down with me? When, when you're depressed, some examples of depression, you, you, you feel helpless. You lose energy. When you see people that are depressed, you know what they love to do? I'm going to show you. They love to isolate. They don't love to be with people. Have you noticed that? And isolation is precedes destruction. Isolation precedes what? Destruction. Let's read about a, a great prophet of God, First Kings chapter nineteen. Oh, somebody say, are you getting blessed already? First Kings chapter nineteen. The Bible says, and he had told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with how how he had slain all the prophet with sword. So this was right after a major victory. I, I wish I could jump into next week's message because next week's message I'm going to talk about the causes and the triggers of depression, so that you can you can be prepared for it. Because the thing is that many of you don't know that you think depression sneaks in on you, but that's not true. Depression actually has a pattern. That's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians that we must not be unaware of the devices of the devil. There is a pattern of depression. In fact, there is a physiology attached. There's a physiology attached to depression. You can tell you're going to be depressed. The way you're talking, you can tell. You can tell. You can tell. Because once you want to be depressed, you start feeding on things that will depress you. You check the account that has 2,000 naira, and you check it five times. Because you want to get depressed. Is that not how you get depressed? That's how you get depressed. So you look for, this is what depression does. You look for something that is not working and you go back to it. And focus on it, and you go back to it, and focus on it, and you go back to it, and focus on it. You keep going back to your ex that's got him married last Saturday. You go back to it, and focus on it. You go back to it, and focus on it. You look at the ring. You say, "But that ring I wanted." Hey, look at the girl. She doesn't. She doesn't have backside like me. She doesn't. Want, what does she have like me? She, you and you begin to make yourself unhappy. That's why I said depression has a pattern. The Bible says this in verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me and much more, if I make not thy life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. See, you know what? You know, <laughs> humorously, you know what I said? I said, the Bible says, and Jezebel sent a message to Elijah. Jezebel did not even do anything. She just posted on her Instagram. That, that's why this was Facebook Messenger. Praise God. This just his messenger. Look at his messenger. They sent a messenger. Facebook messenger. 
Just post it. The reason why is that what is the pressing you could be what you are reading? Because sometimes what depresses you is not, is not real. Because let me have a look up here. Is there any time in the Bible that the Bible now says, and Jezebel chased after Elijah? Yes or no? There is no record that Jezebel did anything. Jezebel only posted, I will do. But that's what depression does because you begin to have anxiety. Anxiety is when you begin to respond to fear that has not happened. It's fear. It's a response to things you fear that has not happened. Someone say hallelujah. So let's see what, Jesus, um, let's see what Elijah did. The Bible says, and when he saw it, he arose and fled for his life. So the first thing about depression, you begin to live in fear. He went for his life. He went in survival mode. And he came to Bathsheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. I, I'm, I'm going to talk about this next week. The Bible says, but he himself went one day into the wilderness and sat there under the juniper tree. And he requested for him that he might die. Did you see that? The first thing you noticed was that Elijah forgot who he was. You know, I'm thinking that if I was beside Elijah and Jezebel said this, I would have been like, ha ha, shata. Because me knowing the antecedent of Elijah, how would I say shata? We're about to see the display of the power of God. But because he was depressed, he forgot. Got who he was and began to run. Question, have you forgotten who you are? Oh, so because you had the divorce, you forgot who you are. Oh, so because he broke up with you, you forgot who you are. Oh, so because of the business appointment, you forgot who you are. So because you didn't get the contract, you forgot who you are. So because you lost your job, you forgot who you are. You were the same person they told in the office, you are the best staff. There's no one like you in this place. But because of the temporary setback, you are now forgetting who you are. Don't judge the future by the past. You'll be making a big mistake. Don't judge the future by the past. If people want to judge your future based on your past, say, you will be making a big mistake. The reason why he says, Isaiah 43, he says, remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old. He said, behold, I do a new thing. I tell people, where do you live from? Do you live from the past, the present, or the future? Most people live from the past. So because all these boys have broken up with me, this one will break up with me. Stop living in the past. Because I've always lost money, I will lose money. Stop living in the past. Live from the future. Somebody say hallelujah. The hallelujah needs some help. Someone say hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. Elijah, for, Elijah gradually forgot. It's one of the things depression does. You lose your self-esteem. Self you forget who you are. The guy, the, guy, the guy messed you up, did so bad things to you. You begin to drag yourself all over the place, going to beg and fighting another girl just over this guy that's irresponsible. He said, because of love, because you don't know who you are. When, when one door shut, God opens another door. Who do you think my God is? Because you lost a job, you now say that my, everything has gone wrong in my life. You lost a job, you didn't lose your life. Yeah. Do you think God that kept you alive till now did not have a purpose? If Satan could not kill you in the accident, he could not kill you through your 40 years. Is it right now that a loss of job means a loss of life? One of the things Satan would do to you is to make you doubt your identity. And that's why when God showed up, when Adam and Eve had eaten the fruit, it says, who told you? Who told you you're ugly? Who told you you not get married? Who told you you not be rich? Who told you you not do well? Who told you you not mix up and surpass expectations? Who told you? What is, what is a trigger that is lying to you? Who told you that your future is, is, is dark? So the first thing is about when you say Elijah lost his low self-esteem and what? The second thing, Elijah entered into helplessness. Listen, people that are helpless have help they don't tap into. People that are helpless, is, helplessness is not an absence of help. 
Helplessness is a state of not tapping into help within. Elijah could have depended on the power of God within his spirit and provoke it into action, but depression made him helpless. Is that not the same thing that is happening to you? Because of all the depression you have, you stop reaching out to people that can help you. You stop, you, you, you even stop giving attention to people that want to marry you. Because you're so bitter, you're so angry, you're so depressed. The third thing about depression is this. You begin to, you begin to become negative. This is how the signs of depression, you become negative. You know, just after the second service, a lady came up to me and she said, huh, you know, this single mother's thing you spoke about is killing me. He said, but I have a man now, Sha. And I said, why do you say Sha? He said, ah, you know. I said, you already sound negative. I said, what is wrong with you? I said, why are you? I said, the guy has not done anything for you to be negative. But based on the experience of the past, you are already becoming negative with this man. What is wrong? Have you become that kind of person that you see what is wrong in everything? You can't even enjoy life again. Everything they go, everything is negative, negative. Listen, it's a, it's, life is short. You need to enjoy it. As you sat down and enjoyed the city is so close. Focus on the message. Stop being negative. The reason why is that when you're negative, your negativity contaminates everything. And everything ultimately becomes negative. Glory to God. I want to hear two or three people's story that want to tell me, you know, I went through depression and this was how it was for me because, you know, we've looked at Elijah's examples. Some people, another example was isolate. If you saw another some depression, as Elijah was going, he took his servants, the next verse, and he dumped his servants. And he says, I want to be by myself. And depressed people have a tendency to isolate. They will not pick up their phones. They will not reply. And that's why, if you want to help someone with this series of depression, say, uh, I will invite her. You can't invite someone that is depressed. They are helpless. They can't help themselves. You will bundle them and bring them. If you are really depressed, you will seek help. You will not accept. Praise God. Let's take some stories about depression. Let, let's know some people have gone through a huge depression story. And just raise up your hands and let's share. You know, let, let's learn from one another today. Yeah, thank you, my brother. There's a brother over there. Yeah. Just raise up your hands if you want to share. You want to, some of you at the back, you need to raise up very, very well. You know, there, there are other people, you know. Yeah, go ahead. You just have one minute or two. So, Good day. Okay, uh, so, uh, so it was about my siblings. I literally lost four of my siblings. Wow. In, in the space of how long? Mm, from 2006 to 2019. Wow. Yeah, and ever since then, I'm usually like, whose turn is it? Because we just train now. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't even know, but the truth is... When you, when, when you lost them, how did you feel? It was hard for me, 2019, when I lost my other sister. What was, how, how hard? I don't understand. I felt really bad because I, it was looking like, a custom in my family, you know. So I was scared, but I don't know who is the next. I was really scared. Good. So let me ask you a question: Are you living from your past or your future or your present? No. I. I mean, I can, I can never live in my past. You're living. Are you living from your past? No, no, no. The way you are afraid of the future. Are you living from your past, present, or future? Although I feel different now. You feel different now. now. But before I, now, we're living from where? Your past, right? You know, memories, so... <laughs> what is it? With memories, you know? With memories. Yeah. Yeah, same thing. So, the thing is, is look at me. I want to say something powerful. If you live in your past, you will repeat your past. So, if you keep saying that this is what happens out they die, then that death will come from your past and come into your future. The way to recreate your past is to live in it, in your mind, and to recreate itself. This is what I said in the other service. Never allow your tragedy affect your theology. Never because something happened, begin to change what you believe. I know that you lost four siblings. 
But if it were me, I would tell myself. I shall not die, but live. And just for you to know, I've experienced that before. Is it 2006 to now, right? How many years is that? 2019. 2019 now. I, I lost everybody that was very close. All my parents died within about maybe five to seven years. My parents, my uncles, my aunts, my uncle, everybody, about seven years. There's a way you can conclude that this evil is coming. I don't think that way. So my father died first. And my father died in a unique, all my parents, my parents died all dramatic deaths. I would like to describe my father's death. Just imagine a Koei club. Your dad leaves the house in the morning. I'm going to watch football in the Koei club. Literally went to the club, the Koei club. You know the Koei club, but that's the best way to describe it. And he died when Nigeria had the goal. Go! My dad had a heart attack, sat on the chair, and that was the end. My mom spoke to me a day before. She spoke to me yesterday. And said, she said, that I should see her tomorrow, Saturday. I said, I should see her tomorrow, Monday. And my wife spoke to my wife. I said, we'll see you on Monday. I woke up on Monday morning, first text on my phone, mom died in her sleep. No sign of sickness. She was up in, her, in the evening, up to 10, 10, 30 in the evening. I'm only saying that to you because what you think is peculiar to you is peculiar to all. And after that died, then we had my uncle that was like the head of the family. He also, his wife died first. Then a year after he died, then after my father died, his own mom died, and all of them just died like that. But the way I process it is not as if, hey, death is coming. No. The reason why is that if you live, so I process, what does my future look like? Because of Christ is in me, I have life and peace. So if you want to move away from that thought, you need to focus on the future, not on the past. But you've moved away from it, right? What? You have. Thank you. God bless you. Who else wants to share? Someone wants to share? Yeah. I want, I want someone, let, let's move. I want a lady to share. A lot of guys are sharing in this service. That's really, is there a lady in the, in the yeah, where, where is the lady? I, I want to see the lady first. Okay, I can see them, but I want another lady in the middle. I want another lady in the middle. Where? Something that has to do with marriage. I want something that has to do with relationship or marriage. Have you found someone? Marriage, marriage. Okay, she, someone here. Yeah. I will come, then come to you. Yeah. Wow. Give it to her. Yeah, go ahead. Um, good morning, church. So good morning. I was married at a very tender age, and I lost myself. I was babies. I was size 8. He said he wanted big teeth. So I had to get to size 18, and we, we separated last year. And it has really been hard, like low self-esteem. I distanced myself from talking to my friends or friends that talk to me about God, I distanced myself, I stopped talking to them, I was in door. and it's, I was so depressed that I was suicidal, I drank a lot of things, but I don't know why God still kept me, because I actually wanted to end it. Why did you want to end it? Because I see myself as a failure. Why do you see yourself as a failure? I, I have always, I'm the last one of nine. Take your time. I'm not in a hurry. Just take your time. I've always been this very prayerful young girl. Very ambitious. Yeah, I'm listening. Hi. Give him my handkerchief. Focus on my business. I studied law, but I've always wanted this to go this business path, and it just came to my life and just changed. So, it. so why? Please hold the microphone so I can hear you well. So, why do you think all of this meant you a failure? I, I've always been a prayerful person, and I couldn't make my first marriage work. And I'm just like, it's not what like I'm a failure. Like, why? Why wouldn't you make it work? You are like, why? Okay. So what you're saying right now is that anybody that cannot make his marriage work is a failure. Is that true? To me, yes. To you? Okay. Name the people you respect in the Bible. I respect Sarah. Sarah? 
Is she, was she a failure? <coughs> she made her marriage work by giving a maid to sleep with her husband. Oh, she was a great, she was a great wife. She was like a fantastic wife. And she made her marriage work by giving a maid to... A, a mistake is the reason why we have rivalry in two tribes today in the world. The reason why I'm saying so is that if marriage is what to make you great, why did just Christ say some people will never marry? Just was never married. Was it not great? Marriage is good. But greatness is you. It's not about who you're married to. See, there's nobody in this world like Jesus. Who is his wife? Can you please tell me his wife? Because for you to be great, you have to stay married and keep your marriage. Who was Jesus? What's your name, please? My name is Tim Tope. Tim Tope. Tim Tope, please tell me just his wife. I hope you knew that when he had disciples that were way younger than him, Peter, Peter was married. Jesus never felt one day that, my God, I'm not married. I'm a failure. My follower, Peter, that's younger than me, is married. I'm even praying for the mother in law that is sick. You know what I'm saying? So, the reason why you feel like a failure is not what happened to you. It's because you've told yourself that if I cannot keep my marriage, I am a failure. You are a lawyer. Yes or no? I studied law. You studied law. You graduated from your law school. Did you graduate from it? Did you finish it? No, I've not been to law school. You've not been to law school. You can start out tomorrow. Tell me, top boy. Let me tell you something that is happening to you. So, since you find it this way, what what other wrong things have got into place? Because I want to show you why you need to overcome. Give me my stool. Hey. What other wrong things have happened since you had this separation or divorce? I sold my business. I used to have a store in Bagada. You used to have a store in Bagada. What happened? I, I can't it. hear you, please. I sold it. You sold it. Yeah. What else happened? I sold my car. You sold your car. How is your health? Is your blood pressure high? Sometimes. Sometimes. Because this is it. I want to show you something. Oh, my God. I, 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 I wish I could go deeper just because of time. I want, I want to show you something. James chapter 3, verse 16. This is what depression is like. This, this depression. James 3, 16. Put on the screen. This is depression. Pick up those nails. Show me one of them. Just, you know, give, give me some. Yeah. All this nail represents evil that destroys people's destiny. And there are many nails there. There are many nails there. These are many nails. That this, these nails destroy people's destiny. They punch up people's destiny. This is a magnet. You know, put the nails back for me. See what the Bible says. It says, for everywhere there is envy and strife, there is what? Confusion and what? It says, once you allow depression comes in, guess what? This is depression. Once depression, Satan doesn't need to attack your business. He doesn't need to attack your finance. He doesn't attack your children. You will, with your hand, destroy the children. He doesn't need to touch them. Once it brings depression, watch this now. Hey, hey, depression has come in. Yes? Every evil work has come. And that's why, did you see, how did I know that she must have lost other things? Because as soon as she depressed, she start making bad decisions. Then she sold her business. Where would she get money from? Then she sold her car. Then she has high blood pressure, so she's now using blood pressure drugs from money that she's not making. And that's why, let me tell you something, no matter how spiritual your friend or you are, one of the most important teaching you will hear from me this, this year is this teaching. Overcoming depression. And let me tell you something. I mean, we're about, I'm about to close, you know, because just because of time, the next episode is already, people are outside and it's overflowing. But the thing you have to do is that you need to move. No matter how depressed you are, please drag yourself and get help. And what does help look like? I will show you in a bit. Help looks like coming to Sunday or watching the service again. Help looks like Timmy Topper that is talking right now because you heard that crying. It's not easy to talk in public. But guess what? This is the beginning of your healing. Give it back to her.
So tell me, talk about how do you live at night in the mornings? What what goes on? <laughs> has not been easy. It has not been easy. Do you want to remain like this? Do you have children? I lost them. You lost them. Do you want to remain like this or you want to change? Change. You want to change. Yes. Why do you want to change? Because I want to be genuinely I can hear you, please. Because I want to be genuinely happy. You want to be genuinely happy. Yes. Who will give you happiness? Is it your ex husband? Is it myself? Is it yourself? Myself. Is it yourself? Do you commit to doing that for yourself? Yes. I want to ask you a question. If you live this way, in the next 10 years, how old, not your age, how old will your body, your life, your thinking, how will it be in the next 10 years? It will be very bad. What? It will be very bad. It will be very bad. Now, add 20 years to it. If you keep living this way, if you can see yourself in the future, in 20 years' time, how old will you be? In 20 years' time, how old? Not, not how old will you be. Just think of how your body will look like. Just imagine the pain you'll feel in 20 years' time. Is that what you want? No. When are you going to change? No. When? No. What are you going to change? I'm going to change how I think. Yeah. Let me tell you how you're going to change. You're going to change what you focus on. You focus on what is not working. I want you to focus on what is working. What is working in your life? You've picked up yourself to talk. That's what's working. Because this depression has taken your prayer life, he has taken your Bible study, he has taken your car, taken your business, he has taken everything. Yes. Tell me. Yes. I even distance myself from friends that talk to me about God. And I'm the one that I always bring them to God. Like, let's pray, let's go to church for. I have to distance myself. I stopped picking their calls. I, used... I was just indoor, I was just on my own. Yeah. I'm not surprised because I told you that one of the things depression does is to isolate. Because isolation precedes what? Destruction. What are you going to do today? I'm going to start all over again. You're going to look for those friends. Mention three of their names. Offery. Where's Offery? Is she here? Yeah, she You're looking back. She brought me. Where's Offery? <laughs> Offery, where are you? Is she in this service? Maybe she's not in this service. You're going to be, every day you're going to talk to Offering. You're going to look for three more friends. Every day you guys are going to, you're not going to pray for anything. You're just going to thank God because things are working out. So this is my challenge. You and Offering, tell Offering that I said that for the next 21 days, you guys will get up for five minutes. Just thank God for things that are working. See you after 21 days with a miracle. <laughs> Praise God. One of the things, one of, one of the powerful things we need to do is this. Job chapter 14. Oh, wow. Please, I need to close. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray. I just looked at the time. I didn't realize. Let's pray. Can you stand on your feet? I'm sorry. Let's, let's pray. Watch the remaining online in the second and first service. The people outside, it's, it's a lot of people outside. So I say, can't we just continue? You need to pay for a bigger venue so that we just have one service. You know what I want to do today? You heard Mr. Ikena's testimony. God healed liver inside. Lord, you can heal liver, heal my heart, heal my soul, heal my soul. I have been damaged because of what I've been through. Heal my soul. Lift up your voices. Let's pray everywhere. Lift up your voices. Let's pray. Heal my soul, O oh Lord. Heal my soul, O oh Lord. Heal my soul, O oh Lord. And, and, and Father, we thank you for the work of grace you're doing. Please, Lord, heal the souls of your people today. In Jesus' name. One simple thing you can do just before next week to help, the, to help this is, number one, begin to practice Thanksgiving every day. Second thing is I look for people that speak faith to you. Surround yourself with them. Find 
We believe in small groups in our church. Join one. Let someone speak faith to you. Next week, Sunday, if you know someone that is struggling with dimension, drag them. Are you not happy that she was dragged to church? Drag them to come. God bless you. you can have your sets. Praise God. All right.